Dr. Yuan has taught Bible at Moody Bible Institute for over 10 years, and his speaking ministry on faith and sexuality has reached five continents. He speaks at conferences, on college campuses, and in churches. He has co-authored with his mother their memoir, Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God, A Broken Mother's Search for Hope, of which over 100,000 copies have been sold and is now translated into seven languages. He's also the author of Giving a Voice to the Voiceless, based on his PhD research of helping Christian colleges understand how to care well for the LBGT uh, community members. Christopher graduated from Moody, Moody Bible Institute in 2005, Wheaton College Graduate School in 2007 with a Master's of Arts in Biblical Exegesis and received his Doctorate of Ministry in 2014 from Bethel Seminary. Dr. Yuan's newest book is Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, Sex, Desire, and Relationships Shaped, Shaped by God's Grand Story. Later on this afternoon, Dr. Yuan will be presenting a colloquium at 3.30 in Snyder on homosexuality, uh, nature or nurture, and that's followed by uh, an open discussion among students led by our student development staff, I think in the Upper Union, just to discuss this whole area and to explore what Dr. Yuan has said. So, Christopher, come join us and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kirby. Appreciate it. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for every good and perfect gift. Lord, we know that it is only in you that we have life. And I pray, Lord, as we address this issue, that we would do it full of grace and full of truth. And we ask this in the beautiful name of your son, Jesus. Amen. For God so loved the world. That's a verse that many of us know very, very well. I'm going to assume that some of you even memorized that as a child. For God so loved the world. And the truths communicated in that are so profound and sometimes unfathomable. But as we memorize that verse, I think sometimes we forget what the verse does not say. The verse does not say, for God only loved Christians. The verse does not say, for God only love straight people. The verse does not say, for God does not love the gay community. The Bible, this verse says, for God so loved the world. And the world doesn't mean just the rocks and the, and the soil and the mountains and the trees. This verse implies that God so loved everyone who lives on this earth, who has lived on this earth, and who will live on this earth. Let that sink in. For God so loved the world. And I know that to be true, that God loves even those who have yet to put their faith in Christ, because I was one of those people. I was not raised in a Christian home, my parents raised me with very traditional Chinese values, and I could distill that to three things. Obey your parents, do well in school, and of course, practice piano. <laughs> you see, I did not fit in with the other American boys. I looked different, I acted different, and I had different interests. God had given me the gifts of music, of sensitivity, and Satan can't, um, uh, can't, Satan can't take away those God-given gifts, but he can twist the perception of them. And from a young age, I was viewed and ridiculed as being effeminate. I, it was in my youth that I realized I had these attractions. I was nine years old when I came across pornography at a friend's house. And it was at that time that I realized I had these attractions. I was different from everyone else, but I didn't tell anyone. I kept those hidden through high school, college, even the Marine Corps Reserves. In my early 20s, I no longer kept it a secret, and I came out of the closet. I broke the news to my parents, my, uh, and I told them I am gay. My mom, she was not a Christian, uh, she thought that she could give me an ultimatum, kind of your typical tiger mom, kind of control the situation. She told me, well, you need to either choose the family or choose this. For Chinese, family is everything. Well, for me, this was not a choice. Obviously, this is who I am. And I told her, if you can't accept me, I have no other choice but to leave. And I went back to Louisville. 
where I was going to dental school. I'm from Chicago. Well, my parents were, my mom was devastated. She kind of felt like I was rejecting her. As a matter of fact, the timing could have been any worse. My parents' marriage was a disaster for years. They actually had begun the paperwork for a divorce. So she actually had committed on top of all of this that was going on. My brother was kind of rebellious as well. Uh, she was, that uh, this is the end of the rope. She had committed to end her life. Amazingly, God gave her life. And within a few months, my father also became a Christian. Well, I went in the opposite direction, wanted nothing to do with Christianity, and I uh, went in the opposite direction. Unfortunately, I spent most of my free time in the gay clubs while I was going to dental school, and I began experimenting with drugs. Now, to be really clear, I'm just telling my story. I'm not at all trying to imply that somehow all gays and lesbians do drugs or are promiscuous. That's not true. Some do, some don't, but... That definitely is part of my story. If I tell you it, I have to be honest. I have to be completely transparent about my story. I don't want to hide anything. But I also want to communicate to you that when you encounter Christ, he will impact every aspect of your life. So I began experimenting with drugs, but like my classmates, I didn't have much money. And if I was going to do drugs, I needed to support my habits somehow. And I did that by selling drugs. And I sold to friends, classmates, even a professor. See, I actually thought I could live this double life of being a graduate student by day and a promiscuous drug dealer by night. But three months before I was to receive my doctorate, the administration expelled me. So my parents, uh, so I moved from Chicago, I'm, I moved from uh, Louisville to Atlanta. And there I kept doing what I knew how to do best, which at time was to have fun, party, sell drugs. And I moved from just being a, uh, a dealer to being a supplier to other dealers in over a dozen states. In addition, it was nothing for me to have multiple anonymous sexual encounters each and every day. Because according to the world, I had it all. Money, fame, drugs, and sex. I had exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And I began worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. Because in my world, I had become God. My parents had no, no clue that I was doing drugs or even selling drugs, but they knew my biggest need was to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. They knew that it wasn't that I needed to change my orientation. They, didn't, they knew that even if I got married to a woman and if I didn't know Christ, I was still lost. So they prayed for a miracle. My mother began to pray a bold prayer. Actually, um, while I was there in Atlanta, um, they came to visit me one time, and I told them to get out. You know what's so interesting? They weren't preaching at me. They didn't do any of that. They weren't telling me I was living sin, as you'd think. But just the fact that God had so radically transformed their lives that they radiated Christ, that was offensive to me. And you know, you hear the narrative today Christian parents, conservative evangelical Christian parents are unable to love their gay children. And only if you become a progressive Christian or you shed your faith and become an atheist, it's only then that you can love your gay child. But actually, from my experience, I had the exact opposite. My parents were not Christian. They were atheists. They rejected me. And it was only until they became followers of Christ that they knew that they could love their child. You know, we talk about love. And that is so important. God is love. But are we going to take the world's definition of love, which means, oh, just do whatever you want to do. You be you. Or are you going to take God's definition of love, which is to love us while we were powerless, to love us while we were still sinners, to love us while we were even his enemies, Romans 5. And that's the way my parents loved me, even when I rejected God, even when I was a sinner. That is God's love, to love us while we were sinners. And so I kicked them out, and my dad, before he left, wanted to give me something. And it was very first Bible. And this Bible, unlike maybe many of the Bibles that you see in Christian people's homes, was actually read. What a surprise. 
It was actually read. Every day he read it. It was all dog-eared. He highlighted. I mean, it was obvious he read it because there was notes in the margins. And I told my dad, I don't want your Bible. I mean, think about it. I, I didn't want him to, to believe that I actually might read that thing. He left it on a kitchen counter anyway and walked out the door. And as soon as they left, I took my father's Bible and I threw in the trash can. I wanted nothing to do with God and certainly nothing to do with the Bible. And after that visit, it was more than obvious to my parents that I was totally unreachable and completely hopeless. But my parents committed not to focus on the hopelessness, but upon the promises of God. And along with over a hundred prayer warriors from their church, from their Bible study fellowship group, they began to cry out to God for me. My mother began to pray a bold prayer, God, do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to you. In her desperation, she fasted every Monday for seven years and once fasted 39 days on my behalf. She spent hours in a prayer closet every morning interceding for me, for many others. She knew that it was going to take nothing short of a miracle to bring this prodigal son to the father. And a miracle is exactly what God did. This miracle came with a bang on my door. I opened up my door and on my front doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police and two big German shepherd dogs. They just confiscated all my money, my drugs, and I was charged with the equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana, which is legal here now in Illinois, right? <laughs> With that amount, I was facing 10 years to life in federal prison. I just started with a bright future among society's finest in academia, and I found myself in the ditch among society's despised in the Lani City Detention Center. So I tried calling home, dreading making that phone call. Just imagine the earful that I was going to get on the other line. But my mother's first words were, son, are you okay? No condemnation, no berating words, just words of unconditional love and grace. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. The text does not say that it's God's anger. It's not God's wrath but it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And even on that miserable day, God was pouring out his grace and drawing me to himself through the words of my mother. Actually, my mom was a bit excited to get that phone call, if you can believe it or not. She, she, uh, she knew she had to do like that good old hymn says, count your blessings, name them one by one. No matter what storm she was going through, she had to count her blessings. So she set the phone down. Next to the phone was a calculator, and she tore off a little piece of the adding machine tape, and she wrote down these first blessings. Christopher is, is in a safe place compared to before, <laughs> and he called home for the very first time. As my years in prison passed, she kept adding to this list and counting her blessings, and today this list of blessings is longer and taller than she is, both sides. Three days later, I was walking around the cell block, and I passed by this garbage can, and I thought, this is my life. I'm from upper-middle-class suburb of Chicago. My father has two doctorates. I was only three months away from receiving my own doctorate. I had it made. But now I found myself among common criminals. Trash. With my head down, I was about to pass by this garbage can, but something on top of the trash caught my eye. I bent over, I picked it up, and it was a Gideon's New Testament. Took that New Testament back to my cell, opened up that good book. For the first time, 
I read through the entire gospel of Mark that night. But you know, let me tell you, I was not thinking this is the word of God, and I certainly wasn't thinking this is the answer to some of my problems. I simply thought that I've got an enormous amount of time on my hands and a better pass it somehow. But as some of you know, what we have in our Bibles is not just ink on paper, but it is the very breath of God. And it is living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword, able to cut through the hardest of hearts, exposing my sin, my rebellion. And I thought things couldn't get any worse. I was wrong. A couple weeks later, I was called into the nurse's office. I was handcuffed, shoveled into her office. She sat me down, and I knew something wasn't right. She was uncomfortably struggling with the words. So she wrote something on a piece of paper and slowly slid it across the desk to me. I looked down, and I saw three words, three letters, and a symbol. It read HIV positive. The days after were dark and lonely. I was sentenced to six years, better than 10 years to life that I was facing but news of my HIV status felt like a death sentence. One night I was laying in my bed and I noticed in the metal bunk above me somebody had scribbled something and it read, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You see, at the most hopeless point in my life, the Lord God was using the words penned by a prophet thousands of years ago to a rebellious nation, Israel, to tell me that just as God could have a plan for Israel in rebellion, in exile, he could have a plan for me. I had no clue where that plan was going to take me. But God gave me enough faith, enough strength to get through that one day and the next and the next. My transformation was gradual. God was convicting my dependencies, obviously drugs. But in a few months, God delivered me from that idol. God kept bringing to mind other idols. And there was one that I felt like I just couldn't let go of. It was my sexuality. So I was reading through the Bible. It was so clear to me that God loved me unconditionally. But I came across some passages, three in the Old Testament, three in the New Testament, that seemed to condemn that core part of who I thought I was, my sexuality. So I went to a chaplain, and I asked him his opinion. I'm thinking, I'm a brand new Christian. I know very little about the Bible. I need to ask someone who studied the Bible, who's read through the whole book, who's gone to cemetery, seminary. The chaplain And to my surprise, the chaplain actually told me the Bible does not condemn homosexuality. And he gave me a book explaining that view. So naturally, with much curiosity, I took that book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for homosexuality. I had that book in one hand and the Bible in the other. And can I just tell you, from a purely human perspective, I had every reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming, to justify the way I had been living. But God's indwelling Holy Spirit convicted me that those assertions from that book were a clear distortion of God, his word, and his unmistakable condemnations against same-sex relationships. I couldn't even finish that book, and I gave it back to the chaplain. So I turned to the Bible alone. And I went through every verse, every chapter, every page of scripture looking for justification. I I want to find any shred of evidence, anything that would bless a monogamous same-sex relationship. The chaplain said, God blesses gay marriage. So I thought, well, I want to read that for myself in the Bible. So I went through the whole Bible. I went cover to cover several times. I had time. I looked and I looked and I looked and I couldn't find any. So I was at a turning point, and a decision had to be made. Either abandon God and his word, live as a gay man, pursue a monogamous same-sex relationship by allowing my attractions, get this, by allowing my sexual and romantic attractions to dictate not only who I was, but also how I lived. Or abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship. How? 
by freeing myself from my sexuality, by not allowing my sexuality to control and dictate who I am and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. My decision was clear and obvious. I followed Jesus. As the days and the weeks and the months of abstinence passed, I learned several important lessons. First of all, I learned that abstaining from sex is actually possible. I know that might sound weird to some of you, but I was not a Christian, and the world kept telling me it's not possible. But it actually is. Who knew? Second, I learned that sexual abstinence is not going to make me psychotic or sick, no matter what Freud and Oprah say. Third, I realize that abstaining from sex, even for a little while, that actually my sexuality does not have to be, actually shouldn't be the core of who I am. I told myself before, God loves me unconditionally, and that's true. But don't we as sinners, we love to add to God's truth. I added, so therefore he doesn't want me to change. Similar to your friends who might say, God loves me just the way I am, so leave me alone. But after reading through the Bible several times, I learned that unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. Let me say it again. This is important. Unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. My identity should not be defined by my sexuality. I'll say it again. My identity should not be defined by my sexuality. My identity shouldn't be grounded in my desires, whether sexual or romantic. My identity is not gay. It is not ex-gay. It's not even heterosexual, for that matter. Because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. God says, be holy, for I am holy. You know, I thought in the past that if I were to become a Christian, that I would have to become a heterosexual, that somehow the more sexually attracted I were to lots and lots of women, the more of a Christian man I would be. But I realized that even if I had opposite sex attractions, I would still need to flee temptation like everyone else. I need, still need to resist sin like everyone else. So actually, heterosexuality is not the goal, right? Direction too broad. And if you think about it, God never commands us, be heterosexual, for I am heterosexual. But neither did God say, be homosexual, for I am homosexual. Instead, God said, be holy, for I am holy. Therefore, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. That's not the goal. But the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. As a matter of fact, the opposite of every sin is holiness. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm struggling, whether I'm tempted, because we all will struggle, we all will be tempted, but we all, but I need to focus upon living a life of holiness and living a life of purity. Because change is not the absence of temptations. God never promises us that we won't be tempted. God doesn't promise you, follow Jesus and you'll never be tempted again. No, change is not the absence of temptations. Change is not the absence of struggles. But change is the spirit wrought ability to be holy even in the midst of temptations. Because the ultimate issue is not whether I'm struggling, not whether I'm tempted, but the ultimate issue is that I yearn after God in total surrender and complete obedience. As I began to live this life of surrender and obedience, God began to reveal his plan for my life, and he called me to full-time vocational ministry while I was in prison of all places, And I realized it didn't matter where I was, whether I was in prison or out of prison, because my calling would remain the same regardless of the location. And with that change of heart, God did another miracle, and he shortened my sentence from six years to three years, which is almost unheard of in the federal system. So with only about a year left of my prison sentence, I knew that if I was going to continue on a ministry after prison, I'd better learn more about the Bible than just prison religion. So I called and collected my parents, told them I think God's calling me in a ministry, and I asked them to mail me an application to the only Bible college I had ever heard of called Moody Bible Institute. But there was silence on the other line because I think they both dropped their phones. (laughs) They mailed the application into me to prison. I was so excited when I got it, tore it open, began filling it out until I got to the last page where I realized I needed references. Remember those? 
Well, these had to be people who knew me as a Christian for at least one year. I had some slim pickings in prison, but I was able to persuade a prison chaplain, a prison guard, and another prison inmate to write my references to Moody. So amazingly, Moody actually accepted me. I was released from prison in July of 2001, and I started the very next month in August of 2001. So imagine the surprise of my classmates when I answered their question, what did you do this summer? <laughs> I graduated from Moody in 2005. I went on to my master's in exegesis from Moody College Graduate School and then received my doctorate of ministry from Bethel Seminary. And then in uh, 2011, I had the incredible honor of co-authoring a book with my mother called Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God, A Broken Mother's Search for Hope. We wrote this together. She wrote chapter one, I wrote chapter two. She wrote the odd chapters, I wrote the even chapters because we wanted to tell you from our own voice the same situation told from two totally different perspectives, a parent, a prodigal, but the best part is how God brought us all back together. This book um, is now has a free eight weeks discussion guide at the back that many small groups and even Christian high schools are using as a textbook. My newest book called Holy Sexuality and the Gospel is where it articulates what is the message about biblical sexuality. Because oftentimes, the message about biblical sexuality is something like this. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. But you know, you can't build a Christian life on God's no. What is God's yes? And so I articulated this, this vision of biblical sexuality, not just you do you, but it's a vision of two paths, either chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage. And that is good news for all. And, and yet... We have not done a good job at, a, at communicating that. As a matter of fact, Christians, we have a pretty bad reputation. There's a book that's called Unchristian, written by David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons, and it asks young Americans, what do you think about Christians? And by far, it was all negative. From the bottom, Christians, we are viewed to be confusing, not accepting, boring, insensitive, out of touch, too political, old-fashioned, hypocritical, judgmental, and guess what's at the very, very top? anti-homosexual. Look at that, those percentages. Those not raised in the church, 91%. Well, how about those maybe who grew up in church? I mean, we teach them, love the sinner, hate the sin, according to the survey, eight out of 10. And notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say anti-homosexuality, kind of maybe more the topic or maybe the behavior. But according to the survey, Christians, we are viewed to be against gay people. And that is wrong. That is wrong. The gospel is not against anyone. Amen? Can I get an amen? I know like, you know, in our Caucasian kind of church experience, we like sit here like this and, you know, don't say anything. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> amen. I got it. <laughs> Come on, here, preach it, brother. So anyway, the gospel is, a, is for all people. It's an invitation for everyone. Not just few people, not just Christians, not just those who, you know, might happen to be in opposite sex relationships. This is a message for all. And I want you to hear that. I want everyone here in this room to hear that. That's an important truth. Even maybe I'm assuming in the back row, maybe you're the social media aisle where you're maybe uh, tweeting all my really important quotes. But if you can, you know, in between tweeting my important quotes, if you can just look up, look up, thanks. Um, because this is a really important message. The gospel of Jesus Christ is for anyone. Amen. It's not just for some, but unfortunately, we have done a poor job at communicating that. How do we do a better job? Well, I'm going to try to fly through this talk, and there's going to be some important points here. Because I want us to use the gospel of Jesus Christ not only at how do, we, how do we better engage on this topic and this conversation, and that's important, but more importantly, how do we share Christ to our loved ones and friends in the gay community? Well, if you like my notes, um, for some reason the clicker is not, there we go. Um, if, if you'd like my notes, you can scan this QR code, and um, if you don't know what a QR code, that's okay, welcome to the 20th, 21st century. But you can jot down the shortened URL there at the bottom. There's going to be a lot of notes. And, but I'm going to center my talk around four main points. First has to do with our own attitude. Before we do anything else, we need to be convicted about our own sin. 
You know, when I lived as a gay man years ago, before I was a Christian, I felt Christians were telling me that somehow gays and lesbians deserved a harder place in hell. That's not true. I believe that back then that Christians were telling me that Jesus had to hang on the cross a little bit longer for those in the gay community. So not true. But yet, that's what we communicate. And I know maybe you have friends who say, but wait, the Bible says it's an abomination. And actually, that is true. The behavior, the relationships, according to Leviticus, are an abomination. But you know what else the Bible says is an abomination? If you read Proverbs, and I'm just going to kind of just put all my cards out on the table. I believe the Bible. Jesus Christ communicated that it is God's word. Every jot and tittle. So the whole Bible, it's not just the New Testament, not just parts of the Old Testament. Yes, parts of the Old Testament have been fulfilled in Christ, not abolished. If you read the New Testament, that's what it says. But in the Old Testament, there's a book called Proverbs. And in Proverbs chapter 6, you know what King Solomon writes? Pride is an abomination. Causing dissension is an abomination. Lying is an abomination. So when was the last time your friend was a little, little bit prideful and he say, you are abomination? Maybe we should. And when we do, we won't trivialize sin that really grieves God's heart. So we need to be convicted about our own sin. It's not the worst sin. It's sin, but it's not the worst sin. Sin, all sin, grieves the heart of God. And, but maybe you have some people who think, well, you know, it's, but, you know, it makes me feel uncomfortable. You know, I even know some people are like, oh, it kind of, grosses me out. Well, I think that feeling of disgust actually should be a reminder for us that though you might feel disgusted about someone else's sin like that, think about this. That's just a fraction of what God feels when he looks at our own sin. Because our sin is just as odious in God's eyes than someone else's sin. So, because at the end of the day, my hope is that we would put our faith in Christ Not just no. I know many people are like, oh, I know God. I know Jesus. Well, that's fine. But do you realize even the demons know Jesus? It's making no difference. It's not just knowledge, but faith that leads you to full surrender, full surrender. Second, we need to be convicted. And this is uh, consistent. And consistent in three ways. First of all, regarding relationships. What is your relationship status? Are you married or are you single? Because in our culture, in the world, and today, we give this impression that somehow marriage is where it's all at and singleness is bad. And when we say that, as Christians, we forget that the Lord Jesus Christ himself was not married. Paul, the writer of most of the New Testament, was not married. To say singleness is unfair is unbiblical. It's not Christian. You might think, well, it's forced singleness. Actually, nothing is forced. Singleness actually is not a choice. And you know why I know that? I've yet to meet anyone who was born married. We're all single by default. We choose to marry but singleness is by fault. And actually, as all we put all this emphasis on marriage, and especially as Christians who put all this emphasis upon the need to marry, they completely forget Jesus' words in Matthew 22, that there will be no marriage in heaven. None. Marriage is not a part of the eternal reality that we will be living. None of us will be married, which makes almost this question a moot point. We all will be single in eternity. But we corporately, as the redeemed church, will be wed to the Lamb of God. That should get an amen. And so we need to realize that we've done a poor job, that we've communicated. Many of my gay friends say, what you're saying is you want me to be lonely for the rest of my life. And they're equating singleness with loneliness. They think that being single is equivalent to being lonely. Being alone and unmarried is not equivalent to being lonely. There's a difference. And I know that that's not true, that singleness is not equivalent to loneliness, and you know why? Because actually, I know some people who are married, and they're still miserably lonely. 
So marriage is not the cure to loneliness. You know what's the cure to loneliness? It begins with a relationship with God. That is the cure to loneliness, not another person. But we give this impression that marriage is happiness. It's the pie in the sky. You know, once you achieve that, you'll be so happy. You know, I teach at Moody Bridal Institute. It's pretty crazy what happens on our campus. You know, the first date, they're already picking out, you know, how many kids you want to have, and, you know, you want to have a picket fence or, you know... And I'm like, maybe first learn their name. You know, that's a good place to start. The big pickup line at Moody is, you know, let's share testimonies. <laughs> so we see that marriage is good, but it's not an idol. And you think, how dare you say that marriage is an idol? But listen up. The most deceptive form of idolatry is when we worship something good. Good things aren't meant to be worshipped. Only God is. So we need to look to the word of God to see what the word of God says about singleness. And in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul spends an entire chapter not only talking about singleness, but also talking about marriage. And here, Paul says that not only is singleness good, he calls it a gift, truly a gift. And, but the reality is, many might think, it does not feel like a gift. Even though Paul says that, it does not feel like a gift. Like, I don't know any single Christian that I know who's like made that their life first, you know? Yay, hallelujah, you know? Sincerely, 1 Corinthians 7, 7, <laughs> woo! <laughs> no, usually it's the opposite. Like, I don't know what Paul's talking about here. It does not feel like a gift. As a matter of fact, you know, it's actually pretty hard. And as a single man, I'm 49 years old, gonna be 50 years old, singleness is not easy. But having spoken to some married people, I hear marriage can also not be easy. It can be difficult. But along with those difficulties of marriage come some blessings. And in the same way, along with the difficulties of singleness are some blessings. But why is it that we only focus upon the enormous blessings of marriage and the enormous challenges of singleness? See how this is starkly inconsistent? But I want to be happy, you might say. Let me be clear. Nowhere in the Bible does God want us to be happy. Amen. <laughs> God does not want us to be happy. If you can find me that verse in the Bible, I will eat that page. You cannot find it in the Bible. God never says you, he wants us to be happy. He wants us to be holy. Being holy often means sacrifice. It often means pain. We have an anemic theology of suffering. And honestly, it's because we're American. I'm just going to be, I mean, I'm American and I'm going to pick on us Americans. And so here you go, Dr. Philby, you can, you know, join me. Us Americans, we are spoiled brats when it comes to, we want everything. We want this, we want that, we want happiness, we want money, we want fame, we want everything. Comfort, read the Bible. Following Jesus is not easy, but it's worth it. It's going to take sacrifice. So we have to realize that, that it's, it's good, but it's not the best. And I, and I actually wrote, and I think you printed them out, um, something greater than marriage. I wrote that in response to uh, the Obergefell decision where a lot of people were just kind of either celebrating marriage equality or grieving uh, and, and kind of holding up traditional marriage. And I think both were missing the boat. And I call it something greater than marriage. That yes, marriage is good, but it's not the best. Second, we need to be consistent regarding sexuality. What is God's standard? Many people think, many Christians say, well, homosexuality is not God's will, so therefore heterosexuality must be. But heterosexuality, it's way too broad. And as a matter of fact, you won't find that word heterosexual, heterosexuality in the Bible. And that isn't enough to say that that's not, uh, that's not the right goal, because what if, about the concept? Trinity is not found in the Bible. That doesn't mean that the concept isn't. So how about the concept? Is the concept lifted up by God to say, this is the standard, heterosexuality. Well, let me give you some examples of heterosexuality. I could be sleeping with half a dozen women. That's considered heterosexual, right? I could be cheating on my wife with another woman, and that's considered heterosexual. I could be an unmarried man living with my girlfriend with a couple children we've had together, and that's considered heterosexual as well. Those are all sinful in God's eyes. God would never use this standard of heterosexuality when it included sinful behavior. When we say that is God's standard, heterosexuality, we are tacitly endorsing sin. So what is God's standard? I think we need to recognize that these two terms were created 
in the mid-1800s by German atheist psychiatrists. There was no term back then. It's incorrect, though, to say that even though that word homosexual didn't occur in the Bible until the early 1900s, it's incorrect to say that the concept didn't. The concept was definitely known. There was just no name for it. And so the the Bible talks about it, and also we knew it even before the mid-1800s. But the word was not just to describe the behavior or the attractions. The word actually was used to describe, to, to actually create a new category of personhood. It was created to create a new category of personhood. I think that we need to take this category and set it aside and use a biblical framework. And that biblical framework is holiness. You can't get around the Bible and not see that the Bible is talking about holiness. Amen? Every person, if you're a follower of Christ, we are on the path towards sanctification. You can't get around that. We all are pursued, called to pursue holiness. Not those, just those who have attraction toward the same sex. Not just those who are attracted to the opposite sex. It is toward holiness. And so, if it's not heterosexuality, it's not homosexuality, then what is it? It's holy sexuality. And what is holy sexuality? And you think, I've never heard that term before. Holy sexuality is two paths, either chastity and singleness, or faithfulness in marriage. And you might, and I didn't know of a term that included both of those. And when I say marriage, I'm just using the definition that, God, that Jesus used. In Mark chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 19, when Jesus was asked about divorce, he gave his answer. He not only gave an answer about divorce, because as we know, Jesus is never constrained by the questioner. He was not just addressing divorce. And most of the times when he answered questions, he brought his questions to address the more important thing. He talks about divorce, but he actually was schooling the Pharisees on marriage. And he brought it all the way back before the law was written, before Moses, to Genesis, to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, where he says, in the beginning, created made them male and female, and the two shall become one flesh. There's actually no way around to understand that passage to say that for Jesus, Jesus was communicating the truth of God that marriage is between one man and one woman. That's Jesus' words. If you have qualms with that, go to Jesus. Marriage is between one man and one woman. And that beauty is where communicating and that chastity, holy sexuality, chastity and singleness, faithfulness in biblical marriage. And that is good news for all. Third, we need to be consistent regarding change. What does change look like? Does change mean gay to straight? Obviously not. How about if a person still has those temptations? Well, do we apply the principle to any other struggle? Let's say, if I've, let's say I have a friend who was a drunk, comes to Christ, stops drinking, but he still admits that after years of sobriety that he still has these temptations to drink. Would we tell him you haven't been changed? I don't think so actually that the manifestation of God's grace is more evident in his life because he says no to his flesh and says yes to God. So change is not the absence of temptations, but change is the spirit-wrought ability to be holy even in the midst of temptations. Because God's faithfulness is not shown by taking us out of our struggle. God's faithfulness is shown by carrying us through it. Third, we uh, we need to be compassionate. I've been teaching at Moody for Over a dozen years, and every semester I have students that confide with me, they're wrestling with their sexuality. And many times they've told no one, and because of that isolation, some of them suffer with depression and a few even thoughts of suicide. That should move us. They have brothers and sisters in Christ who are wrestling alone. So for some, this can be issue between life and death. You know, we talk about safe spaces, and I just wonder, should not the church be the safest place in the world? So how do we be a more compassionate place? First, we need to expect this is present here in our own classrooms, in our own churches, in our own small groups, not be surprised. I still get that shock, you know, when, when, when someone tells me, you know, I just found out my best friend. He came from a good home, Christian parents. He would even homeschool. I'm like, wait, are you really saying that if someone has Christian parents, good home, and they're even homeschooled, that they're somehow exempt from struggling with sin? Okay, newsflash. I'm sensing in this room, I bet there's probably... Maybe a handful of you here that's wrestling with sin. Don't raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass you. I have you stand out. Let's be real. All of us are fighting our flesh. We all, Romans 7, I mean, we do what we don't want to do, as Paul says. So 
actually, you know, I mean, what's the body of Christ? Are we a group of people who've got it all together, don't have any problems, got our ducks in a row, and we meet once a week, we sing kumbaya? Is that what we are? Or is the body of Christ a group of people who know we're broken and we desperately need Christ? I'll just be honest with you. I am broken and I need Christ. Anyone out there that can relate to that in any way, shape, or form? And so let us all, hand in hand, walk together to him. Not because I can fix you. I can't. Not because I have the answers. I don't. But I know someone who does. And his name is Jesus. Second, know your position. And this is more than just don't do it. It's bad. No, that's true. But we gotta, it, there's something more. You know, my main takeaway for all my messages is this that my hope is that people would put put their faith in Christ, that they will fully surrender to him. Jesus tells us what it means to follow him. He says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. You know, we talk about, well, I want this, I want that. Jesus says, deny yourself. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. Following Jesus should cost us everything. If it hasn't, you're following the wrong Jesus. So when we give up everything and allow Jesus to maybe keep us a few things, we realize those are no longer ours, but all his. Third, you need to, maybe, maybe if you have a friend who you've always wondered whether they're wrestling with this and you think, well, how do I bring it up? How do I ask them so I like, can let them know that I'm walking, I'm there for them, and I can walk with them through this? How do I bring it up? Don't. Imagine if someone came up to you out of the blue and asked, hey, do you have same-sex attractions? Are you gay? Awkward. Don't do that. Instead, give assurance of your friendship. Tell them, I thank God for you, and I just want you to know nothing can change my love for you, my friendship. You've just created this safe space and invited them in this. Fourth, and this is really important. Again, the, the social media group in the back. If you can all look up, this is very, very important. Fourth, let's have zero tolerance on the gay jokes and the bullying. No longer. It's not Christ-like to make fun or demean others. Can I get an amen for that? You know, when I grew up, I was made fun of, called all different types of names. I mean, I grew up in a suburb where there was no Asians, except my brother. And they called me all sorts of names. And on top of that, gay, fag, sissy. And teachers would tell me, sticks and stones will break your bones, words will never hurt you. That's a lie. Words can crush the spirit of a child or any human being. So let us use our words to build up and not tear down. Amen? And, let's, and I know not everyone is here in the chapel, but can you spread that word to our friends in the classes, on your sports teams, elsewhere? Amen? Because this is Greenville University, and we're built on the love of Christ. And we are not going to make fun of others. Can we, can we do that? Let's be a campus that tries to make that a reality, not only in our life, but also others. Amen? Like, help other people to maybe expand their vocabulary. You know, what an idea. Learn new words, you know? Instead of saying, that's so gay, you know, that shirt is so gay. Uh, a shirt can't be gay. You know, that's just not possible. How about instead of saying that's so gay, how about that's so Baptist or that's so Presbyterian or something really creative like that? <laughs> then we need to be complete. This is, we need to be complete. Complete in our message, we focus upon God's truth because it's the truth that sets us free. So you might think, okay, what is God's truth? Oh, that's easy. It's a sin. Okay. Well, anything more? No, that's it. It's a sin. When that's all we say, that's equivalent to giving someone a one spiritual law tract. You guys remember the four spiritual laws? This is one spiritual law that goes something like this. You're a sinner, you're going to hell, sorry. In case you didn't know, that's not good news. That's bad news. But think about this. That's the only message we've been giving to our gay friends. You're a sinner, you're going to hell, there's no hope for you. It's no wonder why the gay community want nothing to do with us. Because we have not been giving them the good news. We've been telling them the bad news only. We have not been sharing them the whole truth. We've been sharing them in incomplete truth. And when you tell someone an incomplete truth, that's just as harmful as telling someone a lie. So what is the complete truth? In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then, in this, and then he lists 10 sins. And in this list of 10 sins are two Greek words that focus upon homosexual behavior that's rooted actually in the Septuagint of, of, of Leviticus, which is why it says Leviticus, those verses still stand today because Paul 
quoted them and repeated them in 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Timothy 1. So sometimes people look at these list of 10 sins, zero in on those two and say, look, gays and lesbians, water and hate the kingdom of God. When they do that, they conveniently forget, forget about the eight other sins. Because if we focus on all 10 sins, get this, none of us should inherit the kingdom of God. None of us. But I praise the Lord, Paul did not stop there. He goes on to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, such were. What, what tense is that verb? Past. Such were. Some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit of our God. That actually is not good news. That's amazing news. That is news that we can declare to anyone who needs to know about Jesus Christ. So our message has to be redemptive. It needs to focus upon the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, our friends in the gay community, their main issue, if you want to talk about it like that, is not their sexuality. It's their need to fully surrender to Christ, as is our, all of our needs. You know, my biggest sin was not being in a same-sex relationship. That was not my biggest sin. My biggest sin was unbelief. So how do we be redemptive? I'm going to give some practical things here at the very, very end. And um, first, you need, uh, how do we share Christ with, how do we walk with those Christians who experience same-sex attractions and know this is sin? How do we, walk? let's just say after this week, you have a good friend that confides with you about their sexuality. You know what to say or do. First, thank them. Thank them that they trusted you with this. Don't freak out. Ask them questions. Ask them how your faith fits into this. Second, tell them that they're not alone. In my research, I found that many Christians who who identified as LGB or same-sex attracted thought that they were all alone, and that's a scary place to be. Third, and this could be the most important point, help remind them that their identity needs to be in Christ. I don't know of anything else where we have placed our personhood, our essence, in what we feel. I don't know of anything else. I'd love for someone to provide me that example, nothing, of what we feel or what we think, or even what we do. Our identity is grounded in being created in God's image, Genesis 1, and if you know Christ, then you are a child of God. Then your identity is in Christ, nothing else. Fourth, we need to be realistic. Don't give these pro- false promises. Oh, just, you can pray, the way, pray away the gay. No. Prayer is, is important. But I pray so that when difficulties come, I can remain faithful to God. Fifth, don't focus on the externals, how people walk or talk. That's not as important as heart change, which the gospel is about. Sixth, we need to encourage God-honoring uh, same-sex friendships in the body of Christ, in the spiritual family. And that's what I needed most. Then what, how do we share Christ with those in the gay community? Many of them who don't know Christ. This is what you should not do. Do not compare this with an addiction, pedophilia, or murder. That's not a good way to win people to Christ, by the way. Um, Also, don't use the two words, lifestyle or choice. I never used those words when I lived as a gay man. Um, And I'm... You know, and that's because I had the wrong view of who I was. Third, don't say love the sinner, hate the sin. Christians, we love that phrase. Unbelievers hate that phrase. Do it, don't say it. When you tell someone, I love you, but I hate your sin, they don't feel loved. So just don't say it. Fourth, don't feel the need that you have to debate with people all the time. There's a time for truth, but that's once God softened their heart. Then what should you do? First, you need to pray and fast. You guys remember the movie War Room? That movie, War Room, was produced and written by the Kendrick brothers, and then it was turned into a book, with, and they partnered with Chris Fabry. The book was given to my parents and I. We got a complimentary copy. When we opened it up, we saw that Chris Fabry had dedicated that book to my mom. Do battle for those who are unable to battle for others. Uh, Second, we need to listen. Don't be quick to speak, but be quick to listen. Third, um, we need to... Don't be intentional. Don't be afraid to invite someone over for dinner. You know, you're gay neighbor or co-worker, and I know some Christians think, oh, am I condoning their sin? Well, last time I checked, we usually have sinners over for dinner. Nothing new. You're just eating with them, not sitting with them. Fourth, be patient and persistent. It's going to take time for people to turn around. And lastly, be transparent. Share what God is doing in your life lately. And don't be afraid of that. Talk about the doubts that you have. Talk about your own faith, what God means to you. What is the word of God teaching you this week? 
You know, because I would never have considered the gospel if I didn't see the gospel lived out of my parents' lives. They, before they preached the gospel, they lived the gospel. I wouldn't have picked up the Bible from the trash can if I didn't see the Bible lived out of my father's life or my mother's life. I did not leave pursuing same-sex relationships because my parents convinced me they were sinful. No. No. I left it because they showed me something better. And his name is Jesus. Our job as followers of Christ is to show a dying world out there that no matter what they're clinging to, all the fool's goal in the world, a relationship, marriage, family, children, money, job, whatever they're clinging to, all those temporary, temporary things are all not compared with the relationship with Jesus. Not only is Jesus better than all of that, but following Jesus is best. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, help us in all. Give you glory. God, we know that following Jesus is not just about what we want or what we should get in this world, but it is about sacrifice. It is about not getting what we want, but doing what you will. Father, I pray that you would give us the grace to live that out today and the rest of our days and do that because you loved us first. Not because we loved you first, but because you loved us first. And because of that, we will do that with joy. We praise you, God, and we ask this in the powerful name of Christ and the people of God said, amen. Thank you.